You're heading south of the Mason-Dixon. This is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Uh, this is episode 23, and it covers the week of April 18th to April 22nd, 2016. I'm Brian McClanahan, your host. Glad to be back. Glad that you're with us again. We've got a lot of stuff to talk about this week, as usual. And again, I'd like to mention that our summer school is coming up June 12th through the 17th, 2016. It's in Seabrook Island, South Carolina. Uh, the topic is the Southern Tradition and the Renewal of America. I think that uh, anyone who signs up would be... Uh, uh, in for a great time and great series of lectures. And again, the, the summer school is not just a series of lectures, a stuffy lectures where you don't really have anything else to do. There are a number of events and fellowship that will take place there at the beach in South Carolina. So uh, if you are interested in going, check out our website, abbevilleinstitute.org, and click on events. If you're a student, maybe you're an advanced high school student or a college student or graduate student you'd like to attend, there are scholarships available. So please consider applying for a scholarship. You need to contact Dr. Livingston to do that. And again, information for that is also found on the website. So we'd love to see you there at the, uh, at the event and um, talk about why the Southern tradition is important, um, what it can offer to America in the future. And I think that's what we're always trying to talk about here. We're not just interested in complaining about what's going on because we could do that all day. Uh, we could, we could um, talk about what's wrong with America all day, but... We also need to talk about what we can do to bring back things that were beautiful and beneficial and how these things could help save America in the future um, and what's worth saving in the Southern tradition and, of course, what's worth saving in America. So uh, that, that whole point of the renewal of America is such a beautiful phrase. Um, it's not making America great again. It's renewing America um, and how the Southern tradition can do that. So please come on out to that. And uh, if you can't go to the event, maybe you uh, you can't get off for a week, uh, take off for a week to go do something like that, or or uh, maybe um, you know, funds are kind of tight for something like that. Um, also, you know, maybe consider uh, uh, sharing our information on social media. If you if you uh, can do nothing but that, share this podcast around, share our articles around, uh, try to keep the word out there about what we're doing. Um, it has to be emphasized, you know, that almost everything we do, the people that work for the Abbeville Institute are doing this free of charge. Uh, this is all on their own time and own initiative in contrast to other uh, institutions who make a tremendous amount of money. Uh, and then, of course, people get um, rich off of those things. The Abbeville Institute, uh, we exist on your generosity. And uh, oftentimes what we do is... is um, uh, pro bono, so to speak. You know, it's it's all uh, because we just love the Southern tradition, and we want to um, ensure that this information gets out there, that real history gets told, and uh, that the Jeffersonian tradition remains alive in America. So consider a tax deductible contribution to the institute. It'll help keep the lights on, help keep the website going, help keep this podcast up and running. Uh, all those things that we do uh, help keep the events going. All the things that we do to try to, to explore what is true and valuable in the Southern tradition. So that said, uh, let's talk about a few things that happened this week. Uh, probably a little shorter podcast this week, um, but uh, there is one interesting thing that happened. Uh, I was uh, emailed an article that came out of St. Augustine, Florida. There's a wax museum there, and in this wax museum, they had a display of presidents, and uh, a local television station complained. That in this uh, in this display of presidents, there was a there was a wax statue of Jefferson Davis off to the side, but he's in this area of presence. So this this um, television station calls over there, and uh, the 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 Action News reporter uh, Ben Becker um, complained. He called up. He started asking questions, and now, of course, changes are being made. Um, and <laughs> it's all because this one reporter said, "Well, well, why do you have a, why do you have a statue of Jefferson Davis?" No, actually, I can't speak like that. Um, 
Why do you have the statue of Jefferson Davis in the? I mean, he's he's not a he's not a a, a real president. He's he's a traitor, you know. So um, so Becker calls the uh, calls the museum, and it's a privately owned company, and they run little tours, and and um, <clears throat> they said, well, you know, if one person's offended, that's one person too many, and obviously it was just this one reporter. Nobody. They actually interviewed a couple of people from New York. And uh, these people said, I don't see what's the problem with this. There's no big deal here. Nobody else had ever said anything but this one reporter. So now the museum is going to capitulate, and they're going to move the Jefferson Davis statue to a, a display of the Civil War. Okay, it's a private museum. Who cares? But I think the interesting thing about this is a couple of things. One, this actually goes back to our conference that we had in uh, Charleston back in February because we had Bertram Hayes Davis, who is the— uh, a direct descendant of Jefferson Davis, and and Mr. Davis Hayes Davis has made it a point to travel around the country talking about Jefferson Davis as an American president. In fact, he goes to presidential descendant meetings, uh, and he said at first people were a little shocked that he was there, but then when he explained, well, look, Jefferson Davis is an American president, they welcomed him with open arms, so Jefferson Davis should be in a display of American presidents. He was an American president. And not just that, I mean, Jefferson Davis was so important to the fabric of American history in general. Not just this four-year period of the Confederacy, but American history in general. I mean, he he was the uh, son-in-law at one point of Zachary Taylor. Uh, he had served in various positions in the government, in the cabinet, the executive branch. He had served the state of Mississippi. Um, this guy was really important to American history. Uh, he had helped uh, in the design of the U.S. Capitol building. I mean, y- you can't get around American history without studying Jefferson Davis. And so it's unfortunate that people are so stupid, like Ben Becker, he's so stupid that he doesn't even know American history and how important Jefferson Davis really is, and that he should be included in a Hall of Presidents. Um, and, of course, this guy also complained that Barack Obama wasn't there. And the museum said, well, look, we just bought the collection. and We don't have a lot of money. So they commissioned a statue for, uh, for uh, Martin Luther King. But they hadn't gotten one yet, gotten around to one yet for Barack Obama. And this guy was very offended by that. Well, well, you, know, you, don't have, you, don't have, you don't have Barack Obama? I mean, what's, what's wrong with you? Uh, obviously, that you, you all are just uh, causing all kinds of problems. Of course, the same, uh, same idiot reporter who's now, you know, troublemaker. <laughs> um, eventually, that's all he is. He's a, you know, Actually, he's, he's just a troublemaker. He he doesn't, I guess he doesn't go down to Juan Ponce de Leon uh, Square there in St. Augustine and see the statue of Ponce de Leon. This is the, and this is the talk I gave at, at, uh, at Charleston. Uh, you know, how hypersensitive people are to Jefferson Davis being in a museum. But yet here in St. Augustine, Florida, you have a statue of Ponce de Leon arguably the most notorious slave monger in the entire Western Hemisphere at one point. Uh, the man was brutal when it came to the treatment of indigenous peoples in the Caribbean. Uh, he made mountains of gold on slave trading. Uh, and so here's this guy, the statue in St. Augustine. Nobody's talking about that. Nobody goes down and spray paints that statue or talks about moving it to some more suitable location uh, out of the way. Uh, we're perfectly fine with that. Uh, the Spanish themselves were brutal slaveholders, uh, so maybe we need to change the name of Florida to St. Augustine, Florida, to something else. I mean, because it it uh, goes back to uh, you know a slaveholding past there in Florida. Uh, I mean, this is how stupid and hypocritical all this stuff is. Uh, so a wax statue of Jefferson Davis off to the corner in a in a Hall of Presidents is going to receive the ire of Ben Becker. Yet uh, he can't go down to uh, the square there in St. Augustine, Florida, where you got Juan Ponce de Leon, and uh, you know, maybe they should uh, maybe they should look into that one uh, because you know if we're going to start purging everything in this politically correct world that uh, might offend someone, well then you should really go out and look at that uh, uh, Ponce de Leon statue because uh, those people were were brutal in the colonial period when it came to the treatment of of indigenous peoples and then also as slave owners. So I just wanted to start with that because, I mean, it just shows how silly this whole thing has gotten. Uh, you know, no, no wax statues. Uh, we can't do that uh, because this would be just, uh, you know, anyone that walks in there, my gosh, he might be, uh, might be offended by a wax statue. 
Um, and uh, he also, this author also brought up, brought up, in addition to Davis, there are also such figures. And, and this, is, this is subtle, but listen to this. In addition to Davis, there are also such figures as Joseph Stalin and Adolf Hitler in historical sections. So, in addition to Davis, who's a totalitarian racist tyrant, there's also Joseph Stalin and Adolf Hitler, who are totalitarian racist tyrants. I mean, this is what he's equating Jefferson Davis to. A, a real American, Jefferson Davis, to Joseph Stalin and Adolf Hitler. Two men that slaughtered millions of their own people for power. Now, last time I checked, Jefferson Davis didn't slaughter millions of his own people for power. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> you know, neither Stalin nor Hitler have, uh, you know, in any way or any way related to anything American. So it's just, um, it's so silly. And of course, the, he concludes the article, the museum gave no timetable as to when the Davis statue will be moved to the other section or if the Confederate flag will be put back up. And again, they interviewed these two New Yorkers. I'm like, wow. Oh. I don't care about that. I mean, here I'm in a museum. This is how silly. I'm in a museum, and you've got a Confederate flag or Jefferson Davis. Um, we're in a museum, dummy. What? Do you, yeah, uh, you're going to have things in a museum. So, uh, <laughs> again, uh, it begins the piece. Right now, it shows George W. Bush as the last president in his presentation, not Barack Obama or President Obama. Huh. How can these guys exist? And if you read the beginning of the article, you think that there's all these people concerned about this. It was Ben Becker. It's the only one who even said anything. Nobody else has said, <laughs> whatever. Uh, yeah, it's a little hole-in-the-wall wax museum, but this is how far PC is going. So, uh, you can... You can find this if you just do. It's uh, it's actionnewsjacks.com is where the uh, article is, and it it was uh, came up um, April eighteenth. But uh, it, it's just so silly. So uh, we've got silliness all over the place, which is why the Abbeville Institute again needs to exist because we need to combat these silly people. Okay, so let's talk about some of the articles we had this week. The first was a, a, a article entitled "Grant Gets the Votes" by Philip Lee, and. Um, Mr. Lee is going to be, he's actually from um, from Florida, and he'll be producing a number of articles, he said, on uh, Reconstruction and Grant. And he brings up the fact that Grant has received kind of a historical renaissance recently, that his reputation is, is, um, is uh, coming back uh, after being classified typically as one of the worst presidents in American history because of all the corruption. There have been... Uh, a uh, group of historians who have tried to uh, say, well, you know, Grant's not so bad after all. And what uh, Lee does here is actually look at a very traditional interpretation of Grant when it came to Reconstruction and Grant's policies in Reconstruction. Uh, Grant was uh, very much in favor of, of radical Reconstruction and probably not for altruistic reasons. Um, I think the, the, the evidence is there, and this has been pointed out many times, that one of the reasons why Grant supported uh, suffrage for former slaves was because they needed those people to vote Republican in order to maintain Republican control of the Union. And it wasn't about, uh, you know, helping former slaves improve their lot in life. This is about maintaining power. And uh, it, without that vote in 1868, Grant loses the 1868 election. Uh, no doubt about it. Um, Grant would have lost... Uh, in 1868, and we would have had a completely different direction in uh, in the United States had he not won. Uh, Reconstruction probably would have ended at that point. Uh, you know, if if, um, if Seymour is elected president rather than than Grant, and of course the Republicans were ingenious in using deceive, uh, devious, I should say, deceitful and devious propaganda. Uh, waving the bloody shirt in 1868, saying that if you vote for the Democrats, you're voting for the guy that you know, shot this man, you're voting for traitors. Uh, and there was nothing further from the truth in that. But, um, you know, but this was very popular imagery and popular propaganda. And, of course, Andrew Johnson had been in there for a couple of years trying to block what the, what the Republicans were doing. 
And I, I'm going to write something about this, but um, I think that one of the great problems with the reputation of Abraham Lincoln is that if somehow he had survived, and this actually comes out of that, quote, lost cause, that if somehow Lincoln had survived, Reconstruction would have been different. I mean, everyone bought into this. Well, Lincoln dying actually was a death blow to the South during Reconstruction. I'm not certain had Lincoln survived, anything would have been different. Lincoln, of course, was in favor of a plan, very much like Andrew Johnson's plan when Johnson was president. It was a very conciliatory plan towards the South. Um, he was going to, as he said, let him up easy. His 10% plan was uh, not very harsh. You know, He was willing to let the southern states come back in uh, very easily uh, and actually had some pretty liberal terms in terms of uh, when it came to um, uh, taking the oath of allegiance and other things. So Lincoln's plan and Johnson's plan were actually Johnson's plan might have been a little more harsh on uh, former Confederates than Lincoln's plan. And so it's thought that if Lincoln had survived, Reconstruction would have been different. Uh, but because he's killed, you know, the radicals just take over. Well, I, I think that Lincoln would have had the same problems Johnson had. And in fact, even though he was a better politician than, than Johnson, uh, which is not saying anything good, Lincoln would have been faced with veto overrides. He would have been faced with mutiny in the party, just like Johnson had. And I'm not sure Lincoln could have stopped it. I'm not sure Lincoln could have done anything different. Certainly he had more political capital than, than Johnson. But he, he can only do so much. I mean, if the Congress overrides your veto because they have a crushing two-thirds majority to do it, there's nothing your veto can do. And uh, certainly there are leaders in the Congress who respected Lincoln more than they did Johnson, but that doesn't mean he, was, he would be able to persuade them to do anything different. So I think this idea that Lincoln somehow, you know, if Lincoln had survived, Reconstruction would have been different. I think that's, that's preposterous. Lincoln would have been faced with the same problems, the same mutiny, the same, the same people in the Congress, and uh, I'm not certain Reconstruction would have taken place any other way. So all Lee is doing here is pointing out that Grant really isn't an altruistic guy. You know, the Republicans, many of them, were not really interested in the, in the, the plight of former slaves and what they were going through in the South. And this is something, had they been interested in that, maybe there would have been a different design for emancipation. Uh, because the emancipation, the way it happened, on both sides, people have pointed out, the way it happened, you're throwing people to the wolves, and that is a very difficult situation for people that, some of whom had skills, and some of whom had education, but um, the majority did not. And so now you just tell them, hey, root, hog, or die, as Lincoln said. Um, and... Uh, you know, when Alexander H. Stevens asked him, what are we going to do with th these people? Uh, you know, how, how are they going to assimilate? How are they going to be part of, of American society? And Lincoln's response, well, they're going to root hog or die. Well, there you go. Uh, and that's what was happening during Reconstruction. So anyways, uh, Grant, in, in Lee's estimation, doesn't deserve any type of uh, reputation resuscitation. This guy should just be what he is, which was a very bad president. And um, perhaps even, you know, I know people are going to argue, well, Grant was a better general than Lee, you know, a, a bad general, at least in the way that he was willing to sacrifice his own men uh, in futile uh, charges against entrenched Confederate positions. Um, and his own men knew it. That's why they called him you know, uh, the butcher, right? So uh, the next piece we had on Tuesday was The Confederacy's Rule of Law, written by Marshall DeRosa, one of the great scholars of the Institute. Uh, if you've never read his book on the Confederate Constitution, it should be recommended reading. I think not just for people interested in the South, but in general, when I mean, you're talking about American constitutionalism, because we forget about that Constitution, which was the result of American thought on constitutions. Just as state constitutions were, just as the U.S. Constitution is, so uh, you know this this particular document was interesting in some of the innovations that it had, uh, which were built off of experience. So you can have innovation that's built just by a theory, or you can have innovation that's built by experience. And I think what the Confederacy did in 1861 was build a constitution based on experience and what they had seen as problems in the U.S. Constitution. They wanted to change those in the Confederate Constitution. And um, 
you've got to read his, his book on the Confederate Constitution. And he gets into some of those things in this little, little piece. Um, he says, uh, rather than starting de novo, which is from new, the CSA provisional constitution mostly adopted the structure of the U.S. judiciary and stipulated that, quote, the Congress shall have power to make laws for the transfer of any case causes which are pending in the courts of the United States to the courts of the Confederacy and for the execution of the orders, decrees, and judgments heretofore rendered by the said courts of the United States, and also all laws which may be requisite to protect the parties to all such suits, orders, judgments, or decrees, their heirs, personal represent representatives, or assignees. And so he says, the permanent constitution kept intact the judiciary established under the provisional government, which for all intents and purposes mirrored the U.S. counterpart in its in original, or I'm sorry, organizational structure. But he gets into the fact that the CSA Supreme Court was never organized. And for one particular reason, the fear that if they organized the Supreme Court, the state courts would fall prey to that court just as it had done in the U.S. Constitution. And this is a very important point to make. You see, what happened to the U.S. Constitution is very simple to trace. Sometimes people ask me, when did the U.S. Constitution die? And I say in 1789, when the Congress passed the first Judiciary Act. And that's because that allowed direct appeal to federal courts. You could bypass the state courts. And so when the Constitution was going through the ratification process, even John Marshall argued that state courts would not be destroyed because there were only certain things the federal courts could do. And state courts essentially were power, were, had all the power, all the sovereignty within their own sphere. So the state court decisions, the states would not fall under the purview of the federal government, in essence, and that there was no federal negative over state law. So a purely state law could not violate the U.S. Constitution unless it violated Article I, Section 10. And there are very few things in Article I, Section 10 that the states cannot do. Everything else is reserved to the state, except for Article I, Section 8, and then the powers that are, that are denied to it under the U.S. Constitution, because those powers are the powers they've given to the to the states have given to the general government in Article One, Section Eight. That's one of the important things to understand about that structure of those two articles, how they work in, in concert with each other. If you look at Article One, Section Eight, and you look at Article One, Section Ten, the things in Article One, Section Ten are okay. We can't we can't declare war because the U.S. government can do that. Uh, you know, so the things that they had granted to the U.S. government, they can't do individually. But that's it. So everything else is left to the states. So the great fear was that the state courts would be uh, basically eliminated by the federal court system. And what we've seen essentially in the last 200 years is this is the case. By creating all these other different levels of courts and by allowing direct appeal to the federal courts on a state law, uh, the state courts have been emasculated. And the Congress could change this very easily. If we wanted to gut the federal court system, the Congress could do it, just as they did here in the Confederacy. They did not allow the creation of a Supreme Court system, a federal court system, for the Confederate government. And so what he points out in this particular piece and, uh, is the relationship between the American Indian tribes in Oklahoma, what's now Oklahoma and the Confederacy, the fact that the Confederacy recognized they were firmly dedicated to state sovereignty. They recognized in treaties they had with the Choctaw and the Chickasaw and the Seminole and these other groups that the these uh, that these nations of people should be recognized as sovereign nations of people, and they should have a seat at this Confederate government. They had a non-voting position already. And that if, if the Confederacy wins, they would create states out of these groups of people because they're organic communities. So uh, it's important to note that the relationship between the American Indian tribes who were in Oklahoma was much different with the Confederate states than it was with the United States. And this is why people like Stan Wadey fought for the Confederacy, because they recognized they were better protected by that Confederate government who recognized these people as a sovereign nation and it's also important to note, and speaking of Reconstruction, this is one of the unknown histories of Reconstruction, 
that when the war was over, these Indian tribes were fearfully abused by the general government of the United States in Oklahoma because of their support for the Confederacy. They were uh, attacked viciously by the U.S. government because of their treason to the United States. Of course, the United States was not recognizing their treaties. And it's also important to note that Lincoln ordered the largest mass execution of, uh, in American history during this time. 38 Sioux warriors were executed at one time by the United States in 1862 under the direct orders of Abraham Lincoln because these people would not, would not convert to Christianity. They wouldn't assimilate. So here we have one model, the U.S. model. Of course, William Tecumseh Sherman brings the punishing uh, you know, total war strategy that they learned in, in the war to the West after the war. You have one model. That's the, the U.S. model. And then you have the Confederate model, which is to recognize these people as a nation and accept them into your government in one way or another. And that's the untold story of the Indian tribes and the South and the war and Reconstruction. So it's a really great piece. Not long, a couple thousand words, but it's, it's a nice piece. And uh, well worth your time to read it. And then go out and get his book, too, on the Confederate Constitution. It's so good. It's one of those books I read uh, you know, er early in my career. Uh, it had just come out. And I thought, this book really, really changes some things in the way you think about uh, the Confederate uh, rule of law and Confederate political organization. And, of course, of course also the American constitutionalism. Uh, it's, it's really good. So it's the... Uh, the uh, Marshall DeRosa in his book on the Confederate Constitution, must read. All right, on Wednesday we had a piece by Clyde Wilson, new from Southern Pens, Part 4. So he brings out a couple of books. One I've already talked about before, Uncle Seth Fought the Yankees by uh, James Ronald Kennedy. Uh, and uh, he talks about what this book is. And he's, you know, it's Uncle Seth, a Confederate veteran, about 100 easy lessons, gently educates the young people of his kin and neighborhood about the war for Southern independence. Uh, it's a really good book. It's very interesting. Um, published by Pelican, um, and of course the Kennedy uh, brothers who wrote uh, The South Was Right, a uh, wonderful book. So uh, I'd highly recommend you getting uh, Uncle Seth Fought the Yankees. Uh, and then he brings up um, a book uh, by uh, Michael Grissom, American Terrorist, Lincoln's Armies in the South, uh, and he says that Grissom has put together the most hard-hitting collection of documentation of the U.S. government's murderous wars against the women and children of the South that I have encountered. We can never have too much of this because it is a truth that the American national consciousness still refuses to face. And on the same token, he brings up uh, one of the books from his Shotwell Publishing, When the Yankees Come, Former South Carolina Slaves Remember Sherman's Invasion. And we actually published uh, an essay on that by Paul Graham, on our website, so it's a valuable resource, but you can buy it in book form now through Shotwell Publishing. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Wilson's publishing company, and they're doing some great work, so you should check them out. i got a link there. And then he brings up the uh, Society of Independent Southern Historians um, and the work that they're doing, So, and uh, Howard Ray White's Bloodstain. So uh, a few, few things that are worthwhile uh, to check out. Uh, on Thursday, we published a piece by an author we had never run before, uh, never run one of his pieces before, Tony Woodleaf. And it's from his website, Sand in the Gears. And it's a good good blog. I recommend going over there and checking that out. But um, Tony Woodleaf is an excellent writer. He's more of a popular writer. And he's talking about this, uh, this controversy in North Carolina at this point about bathroom laws and other things that's going on there and, and how the, the resistance in North Carolina is distinctively Southern. And... Uh, <laughs> You know, how, how he says, um, Robert E. Lee, troubled by the ease with which his kinsmen, kinsmen seceded, but siding with them because they were kin. There's something noble about loyalty to blood, even or perhaps especially when that blood is tainted. It's a backwards notion these days when most people see past and present with such exquisite moral clarity, leaving those few of us whose vision isn't so acute to judge the world as having gone sideways, or at the very least, in need of a few shims. Uh, so uh, the title of this piece is Backwards in a Sideways World. And how he says, and maybe that quality is uniquely Southern, the inherited predisposition to be backwards in a sideways world. He said, don't, don't misunderstand. In an age of professional schooling and instant communication, we have no excuse for moral blindness. 
Take the recent law passed here in North Carolina, for example, mandating that every user of a public restroom attend only assigned to people bearing the equipment matching what he or she or some entirely new and enlightened uh, signifier even now being conjured in a Brown University anthropology classroom received at birth. And he, this is tongue-in-cheek. Now, educated people know this is an evil law. We know this because of the outcry from people who know a thing or two about repression and homophobia, many of them having spent hours cozying with dictators in Cuba, Egypt, Venezuela, and the like. Our moral betters know evil because they have looked evil in the eye. They've sipped espresso with evil. They've played private concerts for evil. But we Southerners are contrary in lot. It runs in our tainted blood. While straight-sided moral people rightly cower at reproaches from New York politicians, Hollywood mavens, and pornography conglomerates, we perversely internalize them as badges of honor. In fact, the best way to unify we feuding, vengeful, petty, grudge-holding, backwards-ass rednecks is to tell us the Yankees are displeased. <laughs> so you want to make us, you want to make Southerners rally around something, tell the people that Yankees don't like what you're doing. And then, of course, uh, it's on. And so he says at the end, that sounds almost like rebellion, which I suppose is to be expected from my people, bearing as we do the genes of raging Scots, bullheaded English, enduring uh, Yoruba, and proud Cherokee. Tell us what to do, and our instinct is to tell you to go to hell. It's not an enduring quality, I'll admit, but maybe it serves a small purpose, because maybe the world isn't so right side up after all. And maybe one day we'll get around to realizing that, and maybe then we'll need a few people whose feet are, are prenaturally inclined to lean against the weight of things, people who can lead us backwards out of world-tilted wrong-wise. Beautifully put that this is what the Southern tradition is all about and the renewal of America. An excellent little piece. So I highly recommend, it's short, I highly recommend going out and reading that, back ways in the side, uh, Backwards in a Sideways World. And then finally, on Friday, we ran a piece by John Mar Marcourt, Healing the Wounds of War. He is our resident um, scholar from Japan. And he brings up two interesting people here, um, James Marion Sims and John Allen Wyeth. Both from, uh, well, Sims was from uh, South Carolina and Wyeth was from Alabama. These were two men who advanced the medical profession uh, tremendously. And uh, he talks about how their statues, uh, at least Sims' statue in, in New York, in Central Park, is now under attack. Uh, he never served the Confederacy. Uh, but people are talking about moving his monument because of some work that he had done uh, in gynecological procedures, which have been charged with racism because he was practicing on slaves and he wasn't using anesthesia, which no one used anesthesia So, at the time. It was deemed, deemed controversial, and his work is controversial. Now, I have to point out that anything in the medical profession that's new is controversial. I mean, we're all just great experiments for doctors, um, you know, the sawbones. Uh, they're just trying things on us, and sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't, and sometimes it's bad, and sometimes it's good. But these two men greatly advance the medical profession, but one of the reasons why they're under attack is because, of course, they're Southerners, and um, you've read oftentimes, maybe before, um, that the South was devoid of anything that was scientific or uh, literary, anything artistic. I mean, the Southers didn't have this. Well, I mean, this just proves this wrong all the time. Um, there's Mari, the great scientist of the seas. Uh, there's, uh, of course, here we have Sims and Wyeth, uh, great medical doctors. We've already talked about Southern literature and, of course, music and art. Uh, I mean, those things are coming out of the South. So the South is not devoid of any culture and science or education. In fact, you could say that the South had greater levels of education than the North, uh, particularly since there were more college-educated people per capita in the South before the war than in the North. And the South was working to educate women in ways the North wasn't even interested in yet before the war. So uh, the South was definitely an educational area. It didn't necessarily have universal education. It wasn't interested in a public education model that the North would be interested in. But still, it had a, a firm basis of education. And you had great uh, scholars coming out of the South. Uh, and both Wyeth and Sims were part of that. Uh, but, of course, um, the thing that uh, Jack brings up uh, is the fact that Wyeth took a lot of heat uh, 
in uh, in the late 19th century because he wrote some very critical pieces on northern treatment of southern prisoners of war uh, in the in the late 19th century. And the most famous piece was an 1891 piece entitled Cold Cheer at Camp Morton. It was in uh, Century Monthly magazine. And uh, he talks about how these Confederate prisoners of war in Indiana at Camp Morton uh, were just facing very high mortality rates. Uh, where He said that 1,700 of the 12,000 inmates died, which was a higher death rate than at any other northern prison camp, in, camp including the infamous camp in Elmira, New York. Um, and so they, had, they were starved. They were exposed to extreme heat and cold, brutal beatings, even murders. And you find this all over the north. I mean, it's not just here at Camp Morton. You also had Camp Douglas in Illinois. You had the same thing. And, and uh, Fort Delaware, uh, you know, Fort Lafayette. So this was willful abuse of, of uh, prisoners of war. And, of course, you have on the flip side, you have Andersonville, which you know, that's the only prison anybody ever knows anything about. And uh, you can put these southern prisons up against Andersonville any day. Of the, or, I'm sorry, these northern prisons up against Andersonville any day of the week. And, you know, um, Wirtz was executed for willful abuse of prisoners, but yet none of these commandants of any of these northern prisoners of war camp were executed and as, as uh, enemies of, uh, of humanity. Maybe they should have been. Um, of course, the instant, uh, the instant outcry was uh, tremendous. Well, this guy's just not... Uh, this guy's just not telling the truth, but even uh, some of the uh, some of the men who had been at at uh, Camp Morton, Union men like one of the surgeons at Camp uh, Morton, corroborated Weiss charges. Uh, he wrote a follow up, but uh, then uh, decided not to carry the exchange any further because of the uh, quote because of the abuse and, and threats they received for publishing what they did. Um, the magazine. They, they just didn't take it any further. Uh, so here you have, uh, you know, a, a vocal group in the North that's silencing any type of dissent. Where have we heard that before? In 1891, you're having a vocal group in the North, silencing anything that would oppose the Lincolnian nationalist narrative, that the Union was right all the time, that the Union was perfect, that the Union was this beautiful utopia of good government and moral self-righteous people. They could do no wrong. Where have you heard this narrative before? Oh, I know. I just talked about it at the beginning of the P of the beginning of this podcast. It's amazing how we nothing really has changed in over 100 years. There have been periods where there's been a relative calm in this particular area. You could say maybe from the early 20th century to about the 1960s. But really since the 1960s, it's been the same thing that happened right after the war. And so um, Marquardt brings up at the end of the piece, he says, you know, while Dr. Wise Bronze bus is safely ensconced within the halls of the Academy of Medicine, Dr. Sim's nearby monument still stands exposed to a hostile public eye in the heart of New York's Spanish Harlem, and thus remains an open target of political correctness. However, those who now wish to not only remove the monument, but also to dis dishonor Dr. Sims's memory and erase his page from the annals of the nation's medical history should take a moment to consider the 1949 epitaph inscribed on the marker at his place of birth. Quote, a blessing and a benefactor to women, doctor to empress and slave alike. Uh, I think one of the great problems of all of this stuff is that it's not going to heal any wounds of anything. If you really want to heal wounds, you need to recognize the good and the good and the bad. But the good is being ignored and the bad is being trumpeted all over the place. That's not going to do anything to heal any kinds of wounds. And I, I would think that I, I actually think that that's not the point of all this. The point is to keep the wounds open and inflamed and infect them because Ultimately, when you do that, 
you create a climate of hostility. And if we're really interested in not having a climate of hostility, then there needs to be a mutual recognition um, that not everything was uh, horrible. That white and black Southerners did have a long history together. It wasn't always a good history. It wasn't a, a mutually beneficial history all the time. Uh, but it was a history. And people had lived around each other for hundreds of years and had intermingled and knew each other and knew families. And uh, I think that's the sad thing about what's happened really in the last you know, 50 years. That story is not often told. So the more we can do to tell that story, the more we can do to say, you know, white and black Southerners haven't always hated each other. I think that's, that's something that's beneficial. That's actually healing wounds. That's healing wounds. But that's not the agenda of the, of the PC crowd. So uh, we're going to continue to have, you know, attacks. Jefferson Davis's wax statue has to go somewhere else in a museum. Well, you can't have it in this display. You've got to move it to this display. Because some reporter named Becker, which rhymes with a word that probably uh, better describes him, uh, wants to move it. And the only guy that ever complained in these New York, yeah, I don't care about that. Who cares if he's there? No, no big deal. I'm in a museum. But, uh, you know, last week when we talked about recontextualizing Confederate uh, symbols and removing, recontextualizing. This is what uh, you know, McWhorter said. Well, this is what we need to do. We need to recontextualize, re, uh, re, uh, well, what's, what, what word am I looking for? Not just recontextualize. We need to rewrite the history of these, of these things. Uh, and, uh, you know, go, you know, when you have a, you know, go to John C. Calhoun's home. Uh, there's nothing really about John C. Calhoun anymore. It's all about the people that work there. Um, you go to, Monticello, or you go to Montpelier, uh, same thing. So, I mean, this is what we're doing. It's no longer about the people that made American policy, or you know, Jefferson's no longer the the great um, thinker. He's um, simply just known for his uh, views on society and his labor system, and uh, of course, that's. That's uh, denigrating these people and removing their stature. So this is why the Abbott Institute exists, because we want to try to fight back against some of this stuff. Um, it's not saying that there weren't any bad things in Southern history or that uh, these things that are brought up weren't bad. But we do this at the peril of, of culture and civilization and forgetting the good. So that's what I have to say about that. Please remember to, uh, to support the Institute. Again, we exist on your generous tax-deductible contributions. So you can find more information about that on our website, www.abbeyvilleinstitute.org. Until next time, good day. Good day.